Bonsoir. Start recording. Okay. All right. We are um, we are on. Oh, hey, Ricardo. Uh, was that you? Oh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. Um, welcome, welcome, everybody, uh, to the 10th or 11th uh, Back to the Sal study course um, on this wonderful Monday. Um, this course is, again, uh, for... Uh, for us to, um, it's designed for our recruit level uh, program at Emma, and it's um, to give us an opportunity to walk through the uh, Getty, uh, principally the Getty text, in preparation for our return to our collective cells in 2021. Um, so um, we started at the very beginning of the book, and we're walking through section by section. Uh, last week, we started the sword in one hand section. So we got through the first four plays. Um, we talked about a lot of big concepts and, and whatnot. So we'll be returning there today. Um, this course is um, principally run by me. So of course, you're going to get my particular view. Um, we're, we're also recording these sessions uh, for, uh, for YouTube. So you guys can watch these later. Um, but since it is, of course, uh, me, you're going to get my view, though um, nothing is the case just because I said it. Um, I want you guys to be convinced by the same evidence that I'm convinced by. Um, so <clears throat> we're looking at, uh, uh, we're trying to understand the manuscript in these sessions, of course. We're taking a look at major points, major concepts, and um, things that we might not get a chance to talk about very much when we're on the south floor training, because of course, there is quite a large distance between the manuscript and the south floor. There's a lot of work that needs to be done um, to make it, um, to, to digest things before we hit the south floor. So um, without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's get started. So I, um, I rewatched, um, like I usually do, I rewatched last week's session, and I wanted to just make sure I clarified a couple big topics before we continued with today's session. So let me let me make my clarifications and then I'll ask if anybody has any questions hanging over from last week and then we'll get right into it. So um, there's two there's two things I wanted to two important things I wanted to clarify on the topic of swordsmanship. Uh, last class being our, the first time we ever really talked about it. Um, so 10 weeks in or so to our study of the Getty um, the 10th class or so was the first time we ever really talked about swordsmanship. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that we hadn't, uh, that we weren't already f um, unfamiliar with some of the concepts. Uh, swordsmanship is, of course, built on, as we know, um, all of the concepts and you know, universals that we've learned about Abrazare. So um, we're not in total, uh, we're not on totally unfamiliar ground, but there is something unique and significant about the longer weapons, which we haven't yet encountered. So last week we took some time to talk about some big topics. Um, one of which was the topic of um, tempo and the logical progression of actions. And the second was to talk about um, the difference between covers with structure and covers with measure. So the one I really want to talk about is the former. The uh, uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, I wanted to revisit the concept of tempo again, and I wanted to uh, talk about the logical sort of flow of actions in, in, in tempo and in swordsmanship. So there's a bit of a paradox. Um, I'm actually not sure if George Silver mentions this. I don't think so in his paradoxes of, of defense. But there's a bit of a paradox in swordsmanship when it comes to tempo. And that is, if we read fencing manuscripts and study them, they're often articulated specifically uh, in the order, the logical order of actions given a leader follower tempo. And, and as we talked about last week, this usually is founded on the notion that the person being attacked, or rather both people, have a care for their own life. So when you have two individuals who have a care for their own life, their basic require the basic requirement of their engagement is that they 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 leave it alive, right? 
And therefore, they're forced to acknowledge and respond to real threats to their body that, um, that appear, right? And it's this requirement of acknowledging uh, of acknowledgement and response that forces some order onto my uh, onto what might otherwise look like uh, complicated chaos and that is two people trying to kill each other with swords so the first kind of order or this or this order specifically we can see right away when one person attacks another when one person attacks another the person being attacked has two choices. Either they can take the threat seriously or ignore it. If they take the threat seriously, they are automatically put into this patient agent position that we were talking about last week. So where the, the patient agent is following after, reacting to the actions of the agent or the first actor in the engagement. And as long as the first actor in the engagement maintains the tempo advantage, maintains the tempo lead, rather, then the patient is going to continually be reacting to the actions of the agent. So the agent's going to try one thing and then try another thing and another thing and another thing until the engagement breaks. And as long as they've maintained the tempo lead that whole time and the threats are strung together perfectly one after the other, the patient will have to react to them or, or die, right? Or risk, risk being, being maimed or, or die. So in a case where we have two people fighting who have a care for their own life, there is a natural order that follows from the threats and counters that, that happen, okay? Um, who is the agent at any given time? Who is the leader in tempo? varies wildly on what happens. So it's perfectly possible for an attacker to come in, give three blows and leave, and be the agent the whole time. It's also perfectly possible for the attacker to make one blow and then never be the agent again, right? Certain defenses by the defender can create a situation where the, de the person who was defending initially, who was initially the patient agent, they act in a way that gains them the tempo advantage immediately. And then they are the new agent in the resulting engagement, right? Um, we haven't really talked about the different kinds of blade engagements, obliques, beats, binds, voids, but um, obliques and beats tend to be the kinds of things that that um, switch the tempo a lead. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about that later. I, I wanted to save that for the sword and two hands section, I think. Um, or save the longer uh, discussion about that. But anyways, so why is this important? This is important because when we're looking at swordsmanship, when we're looking at especially depictions of swordsmanship like we're doing now, our um, we ought to make two initial assumptions. Okay, Number one, that both individuals depicted have a care for their own life. Okay, And number two, that the actions are following the logic of the of an agent patient tempo dynamic okay a leader follower tempo dynamic okay so um, wherever we look at um at swordsmanship and fury um this is what we're seeing okay now the complicated matter and i'm i'm loath to bring this up but I, I i do think it's important for context okay not least because it's obvious to everyone regardless of how new they are to swordsmanship okay and that's this the problem is that this having a care for your own life thing right what the hell even is it having a care for your own life is a voluntary value judgment that a person makes it's not a fundamental value judgment. Anybody at any time can decide to do something stupid and act in a way that, you know, isn't conducive to their own defense. Okay. The, the, the greatest master in the history of the world in any engagement could all of a sudden decide to, you know, 
duck and try a little like a like an ankle biter swing or something like that. Try and hack somebody's toe off or do something you might see in a you know in a big long sword tournament or something something weird. Skip and jump or do something do do something strange, right? All we're dealing with human beings here, remember, right? So when we're fighting, when the rubber hits the road, when we're fighting, we want to fight in a way that uh, in a way where we're still safe, regardless of whether or not our opponent is an idiot, whether they care for their own life, or whether they don't. Okay. So what this means is, is that there's going to be a bit of a difference between the kind of situation that we're studying here and how our experience ends up arising when we learn how to fence. The experience of learning how to fence is a lot more rough okay we have to deal with a lot more edge cases and we have to we have to account for a lot more variation in in choice and habit of our enemy than what we're looking at here here and this isn't specific to fury this is common with um m many if not most fencing uh, manuscripts the basic assumption is that both people have a care for their own life and nobody wants to die and this way, you um, various actions and counters and techniques and strategies you can do can help um, help you defeat your enemy uh, and help manipulate them with this desire not to be killed, which is important. So when we're looking at this stuff, we want to look and understand that this is um, this is the classic fencing scenario, fighting scenario that we're dealing with here. Okay, and I say that. To underline that it's not it's not a theoretical kind of thing right this isn't the kind of fencing and I said this last week a bit too this these kinds of scenarios aren't the kind of fencing that only exists between polite people right this is the kind of fencing that shows truly how the swords work and how deep your mastery of fencing can go when people get stupid fencing gets messy but it doesn't necessarily get deeper, if that makes any sense, right? Um, knowing how to defend yourself, uh, or learning how to defend yourself against people who try to double hit all the time. That's difficult, but it's not more complex. It's not complex fencing. It's just difficult fencing, right? Um, getting good at fighting against, you know, masterful fencers who know what they're doing and who are using all their art and who also don't want to die, that is sort of, that's where the, the deep hole of swordsmanship goes, okay? And that's where this interplay of action, counteraction, action, counteraction comes from, right? We saw last week in the first scholar that this is actually a result of four actions. This position is a result of four discrete things. One, the defendente to the, to the defender. Two, the attempt at a single-time remedy. Three, the attacker's response to that single-time remedy to prevent being killed. And four, the defender's response to that response, which ends up being this, this grab. Okay? So, um, just to underline that, when you're studying swordsmanship, look for the logic. Look for the threat, response, organization of how things are supposed to work. Okay? And that will... Um, that will pay you many dividends when you actually go to put it all together um, when you're fencing on the floor. One of the most common struggles and um, complaints that um, our students have when they begin to learn how to fence is that it all seems pretty overwhelming. All of a sudden, the order that they experience in the drills seems to be lost. And that's because we haven't... Um, that's because they haven't yet inflicted this order that they already understand into the fight that they're doing themselves, right? All of a sudden, when it comes to be, when you can kind of do anything you want at any time, all of a sudden things seem to be much open, uh, much more open-ended than they actually are. But um, anyways, so that was my point number one. I just wanted to clear up. Anybody have any questions about that? I know it's a pretty big sort of concept. 
No? Okay, great. Um, the, the last thing uh, I wanted to bring up was the difference between covering with structure and covering with tempo. So just very briefly to underline that concept again, um, there's a very brief paradox, or there's another paradox in fencing, where in order to hit somebody with your sword, you have to commit your sword to their body. The problem is you're also using your sword to defend yourself. So how the hell do you get a chance to do this? Right? So there, and broadly speaking, when you hit somebody, there's two, um, there's two categories of, of uh, where this hit is coming from. Okay. Either you're hitting somebody and you're covered by a structure. Okay, so for example, if this scholar here, 20 VA, stabs this guy in the face, he he could hit, he could commit this sword to the enemy's body while also maintaining contact with both his sword and his, uh, through his hand with the enemy's weapon. Okay, so he can commit the sword to the body while knowing, because touch again as we said last week touch is the most trustworthy piece of information arguably the only piece of information you'd want to bet your life on this person can commit the sword to the enemy's body while knowing um will be as certain as he could be where the enemy's sword is what it's doing and that it's not going to be hitting him okay so something like this is an example of getting a chance to hit your opponent while covering them with structure okay this scholar, the second scholar here, is an example of a classic parry repost, okay, where he's come up from underneath with a true edge de uh, deflection, and when the sword was deflected away, he turned his sword back over and he hit the enemy. In this case, his sword is not actually covering or in contact with the enemy's sword. So there's nothing structural preventing the sword from coming back and hitting him. Okay, so insofar as it's not a defense by structure, then this this guy is at more risk. Except that, as we know very well, all plays take place in a, a time, in space, and context. And in a classic parry repost, this second strike here is coming uh, down onto the enemy while their sword is busy absorbing the physics that you've inflicted upon it right the physics that that resulted on uh that that the physics that happened when you made the deflection so if you're an experienced enough swordsman that contact you're getting with your deflections you can know with relatively decent certainty not quite as much as this is what you get with the structural defenses but pretty pretty damn close you can know or have a sense of how much tempo you have bought yourself to then commit the, the, your sword to their body and not your own defense right not as opposed to committing your sword to finding their sword again right because you could of course deflect a sword and then find it again right that would be very safe right but of course it wouldn't result in a, in a hit so broadly speaking all the hits that you're going to get in fencing they're going to come in one of two uh, categories are the, you're going to be uh, you're going to be hitting and defending with structure and hitting uh, by defending with tempo okay though there is one more category i left it out last week but i'm going to add it in very quickly this week and that is hits where you're not defending either with structure or with tempo <laughs> and these are shit don't do it okay Hits when you're not defending with structure or in tempo, they're usually they're usually hits that you think you have the tempo to take, but you don't. So most double hits are some sp uh, ha happen because of this, where you know you make an action and you perceive um, that this action has given you the tempo to commit your sword to their body and not to your defense. So you do that, but then all of a sudden you get hit, right? 
and this tends to be because for some reason or another um, you didn't have the tempo to do what you just did okay so um, that tends to not happen with the structural defenses because you can feel exactly where the weapon is so it's much harder for that that stuff to happen with these kinds of uh, with these kinds of things with the peri reposts it's more it's more possible and I'd say oh, with newer students who are beginning to fence and who don't who obviously don't have an excellent grasp of tempo yet this is the big this is the main reason why we uh, newer students often get get double hit right it's not necessarily because of uh, of negligence sometimes it is sometimes it's just bad fencing bad choices right but sometimes it you know it's really truly just you didn't really get how much tempo you had after you did that one thing you thought you built up a whole bunch but actually you built up hardly any at all and that just happens and it's just something that we learn okay any last questions about that no all right sweet so enough about big concepts i said we'd get right into the section uh last week and we are okay let's let's get right into the next uh, the next play our play is uh, our next play is here the third scholar 20 vc okay so here we go who's the first victim uh, doop, 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 doop. alex would you like to read uh, the text for us please <laughs> I can easily hit you with a cut or a thrust, and if I perform an atacimento with my front foot, I'll put you in the middle bind, as shown in the third play of the first remedy master of dagger. Or I can do the play that comes after me, hitting you and putting you in a bind. Man, he sure loves that middle bind, doesn't he? Okay, here we go. 20 VC. All right. So I'm going to, um, I, I'm going to keep this, this whole thing open for reference okay so 20 vc what's happening here so very similar to very similar to what's going on here okay um what's going on here is the same the same general sequence of actions where an attack has uh, been offered to the patient the patient has attempted a single time remedy which would uh which threatens to kill the attacker immediately if they continue on with their committed attack the attacker is forced to modify their attack to bind the patient's cover and then the patient is doing a thing because they're now fall or they're now leading the tempo right they've caused the actor to uh, they've caused they've caused the agent to not only change the intention of their attack but also to react to the threat that the patient has provided so what's going on here is pretty pretty much the same as what's going on here I would say although this entry is a little deeper um, the uh, the scholar has um, has is, has threatened the thrust and got again that first remedy master uh, cover uh, first remedy master dagger cover onto the uh, enemy's arm and it says that they can put um, put them in a middle bind which is the third play of the first remedy or do the plays that follow. Okay, any questions about that? It's pretty can simple. You explain again, mm -hmm. Can you explain again the difference between this and the first color? Yeah, I mean, um, not much, I don't think. Um, not that I would want to get delve into too much. Um, I, I'm not quite sure why the first scholar is crossed but this scholar isn't, you know, I'm not sure if that, if that, if, if that's an important part of the picture. Um, if you have a really good first remedy master cover, you don't need to be crossed here. So it might, it's nice, but it's not strictly necessary. Once you've got that first remedy master cover, you can probably uncross and strike or thrust at your leisure or do the middle bind. I mean, this is a great entry on the sword. Just great. Right, we see our dagger coming in right away, right, um, with this sword material. So we're still very much where we uh, where we came from, right. And like I said, most of these are going to be entries, right. 
most of these are going to be entries. So all of our dagger stuff, we should have pretty, pretty fresh in our minds. So yeah, not much difference, I would say, but it's a little, um, it's a little deeper entry. The first play seems to have, you know, he's got an open hand. If the pictures mean anything, he's got an open hand. He's more like checking the hand and his principal threat is going to be the thrust here. He's actually got the, the whole, he's got the, the whole first revenue master covered. So there's a difference in the footwork on the, uh, the patient, it looks like, too. Is there? How so? Yeah. Um, the f left foot is forward on the uh, first one, and the right foot is forward on the second. I don't think so. So here's the here's the first guy. Yeah. 20 VA. So the guy on the left. Oh, the, and the, the attacker. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, sorry, the attacker. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I, I misheard. Yeah. Um, curious. Interesting. Um, oh, not, definitely I'm not, I'm, in closer yeah. quarters, possibly? Maybe. Maybe. I'm not sure how significant uh, that is. Um, keep in mind that with fencing, you know, people can attack you with different footedness. Um, you know, you can give a fendente with a passing step from the left. Uh, you can give a fendente with a passing step on the right, and it's still the same fendente. You know what I mean? It's gonna. It, it can change what what's available to you once you engage, of course, but it doesn't necessarily change the nature of the strike. So all that is to yeah. say that you can get to this place regardless of the footedness, if the strike is a you know, a fendente or a mendrito. Yeah. Or a squalimbro, rather. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh, but again, the main thing to note is that it's following on this um, sequence of actions and responses, right? Attack, threat of single time remedy, counter to the single time remedy, and then the scholar's act. Excuse me, the scholar's action. Okay. So let's see what comes next. The middle bind. Wow, look at that. 20 VD. We're at 20 VD. And can we have Andrew read the text for us, please? Your sword and your arm are nicely trapped and you can't get away without me striking you like this because you show so little knowledge of this play. <laughs> so if anybody does this to you, Fiori thinks you're a dumbass. <laughs> ah, he's hilarious. All right, cool. So, um, So here we are. We're in the middle key, okay? Um, let's refresh our memories with the middle key from the dagger section. The third scholar of the first remedy master. So here we go. So this is 10 VC. And here we go. We're looking at the middle key. Um, we note that the elbows are quite deep in the picture, which is uh, interesting. And as in this picture as well, the elbows are quite deep. So we have the scholar here who has, he's clearly gone for this middle key. His um, sword is uncrossed. Um, and like the play we saw previous, 20 VC, um, once you've got an engagement like this on the sword arm, then your sword can now become uncrossed and you can, um, uh, you can uh, use it. Though, of course, this is a pretty close in engagement. So what you decide to do with your sword may... Well, it's all, what you decide to do with your sword after an entry is going to depend greatly on how deep the entry is, right? The deeper the entry, the less it's necessarily convenient to use the sword um, at its full, uh, uh, with, a, with a full cut. Um, the more, the closer you are, maybe the more um, thrusting you'll do, pommel strikes, wraps, things like that, or even going into that, some of the half sword material that we'll see a later in the sword and armor. Um, so a quick note now, why uh, why would we do this play, this play, or this play, right? And this is, this is going to anticipate uh, the things we're going to see continuing. So with these entries that we're getting from this sequence of actions, the entry that we're going to choose is not uh, the entry that we want. 
the entry we're going to choose is going to be the best entry given the scenario we've been presented by our enemy, right? Just like it was with Dagger, right? We didn't get to choose whatever the hell we wanted. Based on each context, we got a small selection of plays that we could do if we knew them, right? And we're ready. So in this play here, the middle, this middle bind, we ended up getting pretty close into this person, right? We had an opportunity to really enter in. So, you know, of course, how could this, how could this arise? It could arise in a whole bunch of different ways. One obvious way would be that if the attack was very committed, right? If an attack is very committed and you go through the sequence of actions, the entry you're going to get once you stretch out your arm in that first master uh, place, the entry could be pretty deep. And even with a small increase, you could get to some pretty deep places. And um, that includes this middle key. So um, it's, you know, like with all of our um, plays in Dagger, all of this repertoire is good to know. And you're going to make decisions based on the um, precise nature of the engagement that you get. Okay. Uh, any questions about that? No? All right. Truck it on, truck it on. Folio 21RA. Um, can we have Beanie read the text for us, please? Here I am, easily striking you while disarming you without fail. I turn your sword in your hand, I'll make you fall, so you'll surely rather let go of your weapon. All right, cool. So a disarm. A disarm. What do you know? So, um, like in the last play we talked about, we were talking about uh, context, right? So, if you had a situation... Um, if you had a situation after this initial sequence of actions where the engagement or um, where the enemy's sword was rather upright, okay? So, for example, like the third scholar here, but not like the, the first. You see, in the first, because the sword is not very upright, the, the crossing isn't really a true crossing, at a, at, an, at a cross, at an X. Because the sword is upright, the pommel is kind of tucked in, hidden a bit by the hand. So in a case like this, the, the scholar looking to enter in onto this play, he's not going to be thinking, grab the pommel, because the pommel is pretty hidden, right? Um, but in this case, where the engagement uh, was so, or was such that this sword was pretty vertical, the pommel... And the, and the grip of the sword is sticking out. And so with this entering with this entry action, the scholar has the choice to go right for the pommel and grab it. Okay, so anytime we get into this situation, we're at a um, something of a true crossing and we see this pommel, we got a pommel entry. Isn't that cool? Um, also note that... Um, this is uh, conducive to a disarm. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can take this, I guess. Um, you know, we'd have to do it on the South floor to, to show you. But um, this, 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 this disarm is pretty significant, um, not least because once you're pulling on the pommel, or rotating the pommel, you also have the point of your sword in his face. <laughs> so he's, he's really pooched in this uh, situation. If he tried to jump on you, he's going to eat sword. And um, you can pull that sword away pretty. Uh, um, you can rotate that away pretty easily. So, so a question. So you get yes. this uh, true, true cross at 90 degrees, and then you push the pommel against the sword to get a rotation, or like, or, or what? No. So I think this one actually. Uh, <coughs> I think this one. So he's grabbed it with the thumb down, I believe. Um, is, is, is Kel on here? Hey, Kel, yes. that's right, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, he's grabbed it with the thumb down, and he's going to be, he's going to be turning it up, with the, turning the pommel up. And turn it outside to the left. Yeah, and outside to the left. So, uh, how does... Hello, the everyone. Nice What's to up, see Kel? you again. Hi, Kel. Still um, kicking. 
Yeah, we have quite the international um, uh, audience today. We have someone from China, of course, Connor, our scholar Connor. We also have a guest um, from uh, Portugal. We have a member of GMAC uh, here. The head of GMAC, actually, Ricardo, is in the chat. Uh, so very welcome. Very big welcome. To and you, I don't know if you hear me. Yep, we hear you, actually. Yep. yep very okay, good. now. Hey, hey. Okay, so hi to all. I'm just here sitting and listening, okay? <laughs> That's very good. Glad That's what you. I'm here Glad to. to have you. Uh, I've I've been enjoying uh, Aaron's sessions on Wednesday night with the scholars whenever I can, and I thought I'd drop in and have a see what he's doing with you guys. <laughs> uh, no pressure. All right. Um, so uh, cool. So any any questions about this one? Yes, yeah, sir. I, I still don't understand what like how the cross helps with this if you're oh. turning like. You mean how the how the crossing? Yeah, like so, okay. like uh, how, how does the, the there being like, like this cross sword like is that is the sword like acts like a lever or uh, uh, well, as you're doing this turn with the with the pommel? Right, sure, that, that's a great question. So first of all, in order to if you were if you're this scholar here, right, in order for you to see or to think, uh, grab the pommel. Okay, you first need to see the pommel right it needs to be available for you to 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 enter in upon okay and in a case like this where the engagement of your swords are, are such that you know the enemy's the enemy's sword is extended a bit right their hand is extended a bit that pommel is you know is slipping back kind of underneath the hand it's not very easily grabbable right it's not it's not very convenient to grab you might miss it there are more there are easier options for you and in this case just checking the hand is is a perfectly legitimate option but if you get a situation where the pommel is available to you right because of the nature of the engagement that you've uh, that you've achieved then grab it so you know, not to oversimplify it, but if you see if you see a pommel, grab a pommel, as it were. Does that make sense? Yep. So, like I said in last in the last class, it's the it's in the nature of the sword in one hand as a weapon set to be mobile, right? Not least because with these swords, the cross uh, the um, the cross guard isn't complex, so your hand is in danger the sword can never completely cover the hand that's holding it so uh, in order to keep um, your hand protected when your hand is out it needs to be moving it needs to be doing something it needs to be um, active um, but also with the sword in one hand you have an off hand that can enter in on anything even the blade of the sword so anytime these swords come to a crossing there is that critical danger of that offhand entry and offhand entries ruin everything. Offhand entries are so brutal against this person who got entered in upon. They 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 sh they shut your sword down completely, right? They give you know they build so much tempo for the enemy. It's very difficult to come back from this sort of thing. So uh, what you're seeing here, um, you're seeing a, you're seeing the scholar take advantage of. A, situ uh, a situation that resulted from probably a pretty significant true cross, right? And he's just. If I can make a comment, room. please, please come. Um, this is a situation that often happens once you begin uh, the threat of a thrust. As as the scholar uh, Zugadori, the the enemy, as as Aaron's using the term, uh, will tend to try to shift to cover the point. And in that case, invariably, their sword goes up like this. It's a, sure. a very common follow. So in this case, where the pressure was on the tip of your sword, they're suddenly trying to get the tip of your sword offline, which makes them go vertical because, of course, a 90-degree crossing is the strongest possibility. And that presents their pommel. So grabbing the pommel and wrenching it around requires no leverage of the sword on your part, simply a turn of your left hip. Yes, yes, and that's a that's an excellent point, Kel. Uh, uh, the disarm here isn't going to be really helped at all by the nature of the crossing. It's going to be about your grappling uh, actions here, your your um, what you're doing with your your arm and what you're doing with your feet and hips. 
This is the yeah, threat. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Trucking on to the next one. Oh, the classic. I think you get away. Uh, I'll, I'll let us get away without an elbow push. <laughs> uh, all right, who is next here? Renat, would you like to read the text, please? Here I can strike you in front, but this is not enough. I give you elbow a push. I give you elbow a push, turning you to strike you in the back. I can whip my sword to your neck, and you won't be able to help it. <laughs> but this is not enough. What do you mean? So you've already struck him in the front? <laughs> so he, he stabbed him in the front, then he spun him so he can stab him in the back? <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. All right. So, um, all right. So an elbow push, okay? Um, it's not particularly mystical. Um, we're very familiar with this uh, from the dagger section, but it's important. And to... Arbizari. Yep, and Arbizari and the um, and the Bastion of Cello section and the sword and dagger section. Every, you know, we got yeah. elbow pushes everywhere, right? Even, even the Polak section. Yeah, every section's got the elbow pushes. Yeah, we call it the universal counter um, for, a, for a reason. Um, so similar to the vague concept that we were talking about of see a pommel, grab a pommel uh, here. Um, the elbow push is another one of those things, you know, see an elbow, um, push an elbow. So how, how to understand this play? If we make this initial cover, right? And the resulting engagement presents the opportunity to um, reach their elbow, we can push it, okay? Now, um, let's think about this a little more here, though, okay? A, um, a Mandrito Fendente is not the only attack that they can throw, right? We know this. And in fact, you know, the most reasonable, uh, in, in my view anyway, the most reasonable interpretation of these three figures is uh, that they're archetypes, right? There's lots of different kinds of thrusts, lots of different kinds of cuts, and um, I guess there's different ways to throw the sword too. <laughs> so um, while it's true that we've been talking about um, classically uh, receiving a, a Drito Fendente blow, they don't all have to be Drito Fendentes. And as it happens, with these Drito Fendente blows and with this cover, remember what's happening is in order to stop the, uh, in order to prevent the single time remedy, the scholar is turning his true edge um, into the path of the attack. And since this is coming from the low left of the defender, this is going to tend to have the scholar's um, wrist kind of come out a bit towards their right side, the, the, uh, the enemy here. It's going to come towards his right side. So what that kind of results in is that, broadly speaking, from these Drito attacks, often the elbow isn't necessarily available right if they're deep enough it can be right but when you're forcing your enemy to move to second position the elbow isn't necessarily um, available all the time however if they were to attack reverso side and you were to defend in uh, with a um, with a, with a, some version of a frontale or a, a breve in second position their elbow may very well be available okay and it would be immediately available for nullable push. So all that is to say is that obviously, regardless of what attack they give you, if you see an elbow, push the elbow. But um, remember that this posta can defend all attacks, all thrusts, all cuts. So we have a set of actions that we can uh, immediately perform if we get attacks from our uh, to our right side, and we have a set of attacks or, or um, a set of plays we can do if we get a reverso attacks. Okay. And this elbow push here, it, you, it can happen from engagements from the, the, the Drito side, but it can definitely happen from the reverso as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, and uh, so I'd make the same comments about the next play here. So why don't we just move on to that? And then we'll take questions on both. Folio 21RC. Um, uh, Kel, or no, Daniel, would you like to read the text for us? Nice, Connor. 
Okay. Play that came before. I spun around and whipped my sword to your neck. Don't cut your throat. You can very well call me a scoundrel and a fool. <laughs> wow. That's kind of rough. All right. So, um, similar to to this um, to this elbow push here that we saw. Obviously, the elbow push can lead to something like this. Um, so, in, technique wise, if we can get the elbow push here, we can probably get this um it's just a a result of something some some significant turning action um like like the elbow push um important to note though is that um when we're doing elbow pushes we tend to try and not push the elbow into thin air we tend to try and push the elbow into the enemy so that the elbow push has a has a real structural impact on their fortitudo. Uh, if we push it into thin air, then uh, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes we actually um, give the enemy an, the opportunity to count that easily or to compensate. So pinning their elbow to the their um, their chest and uh, continuing that push usually affects the fortitudo greatly, and it can very well lead to such situations like this. Um, I guess one more thing to note is that, uh, <laughs> though Fiore is actually being pretty brutal with his language here, um, we can see some scalability in Fiore. On the top end of murderous asshole, we see the final play in Fiore where he's he's chasing after the scoundrel to stab him from behind as he's running away, and I guess maybe equal in assholishness to that might be the po the poison Polaxe play. So on the top end, we have that. And on the bottom end, we have plays like this, where the scalability of the violence is pretty clear, right? Um, you could cut his throat with this, or you could maybe not, right? You could maybe do something else. Well, the cross makes a pretty good containment uh, tool. Yeah. You flip the cross on the thumb side against his throat and pin his head back. Yeah, he's not um, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> no, it's a really unpleasant position. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Anybody but, have any questions about uh, tw um, about twenty twenty RB and twenty RC? I'd like to make a comment Please. about RB. Mm -hmm. Okay, that play falls out very very often with a mandrito drito. Uh, when someone cuts sideways or sloppily from their left side, even as some sort of scooping sotano, mm. um, it's very easily swept up from below. So your false edge is going to pick up their flat and drive them uh, because you're adding in, adding uh, impetus onto it, right? You're adding a little energy to their turn. Mm -hmm. So when you step in directly after that, the motion of stepping in is slapping the elbow really makes them spin. So the play after it is is a, a simple follow-on, but you could just as easily use the palm or the cross, whatever, or just just mm -hmm. hook them up with your elbow. Um, any you know anything is scalable, as you say, but mm -hmm. particularly making your cover from tail, you're going to have a true edge against their flat and a good clean beat and so much energy to this play. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say that it, it uh, can't work from reversal because it absolutely can, mm -hmm. but this play really falls out ergonomically from the right side yeah that's a uh, that's a great point cal and to to add on to that um we looked at in this play uh in this play here last uh, last week and again i re i uh refer to it today we talked about covers with tempo right um where you're getting you're doing a deflection you're doing a beat and it's built it's giving the tempo to act um in a way that doesn't necessarily give you a structural defense. Although actually because of this elbow push, I'd say this defense is structural. But my point is, is that um, you can definitely have entry opportunities, not just for cuts, but for entries from beats and obliques, as Kel has just, uh, has just articulated, right? And that's definitely so something to, many to plays. remember. Yeah. So many plays. Yeah. And especially if people are, you know, um, when you get these, uh, you know, it, when you're fencing in tournaments, you're fencing people that you that you don't know, you don't know their personality, and you you see these people that are really committed. They're 
big actions, really huge actions, right? Um, if you can get good beats on them or deflections on them and they are really stepping in and coming in, they can basically be throwing themselves into your stretto. Like they're asking to be punched in the face, you know, with an extension of the hand. They're asking to be elbow pushed or things like that because they're just bringing their body so close to you on their attacks, right? And so that's a that's a great example of how, uh, you know, something like this could, could arise. Um, but it's, you know, if you're not looking for it, you won't find it. So it's good to know. Um, all right. Moving onwards. All right, this one. I love this one. This was a good one. Uh, okay, so Folio 21RD. Um, let's test Connor's... Uh, uh, I skipped you, Connor, but how's your audio this evening? Can you hear me? Oh, it sounds yeah. like Morgan Freeman. All right, please give us the Morgan Freeman read. You attacked with a thrust, and I beat it to the ground. Look now, you are open, and I can hit you. I can also turn you and do you even worse while hitting you in the back. All right. So this is um, this is an interesting one. 21RD, how to, these three, hmm, how to express this. Okay, so I said that I didn't want to look ahead if I didn't have to, but I'm going to. <laughs> so, first things first. So what's going on here? You attacked me with a thrust, and I beat it to the ground. And then I did other shit. Okay. So that's what's going on here. So what does that mean? So in the sword in one hand section, like I said um, last week, a lot of the basic setup of swordsmanship, cuts, thrusts, discussions of the nature of posters, et cetera, et cetera, um, he doesn't do. And um, we... He, he he gets to it more in the uh, when he talks about the sword in two hands. And one of these things is uh, thrusts, okay? So in the um, in the, the Zogo Largo section of the sword in two hands, <coughs> Fiore deals with um, with thrusts. And he deals with them in a little more of a broader concept. Because with thrusts, um, he deals with um, the, the, the two basic things that he would have us do against thrusts in an either or sort of way. Um, and one is an exchange of point, which is called an exchange of point, And the other is um, a breaking of point. Okay. Um, an exchange of point, um, which is actually an interesting, uh, um, I don't know, not it's not a it's not unique to Fiore, but the words kind of a the exchange of point concept is um, um is, is interesting in Fiore, um but the actual mechanics of it are very common right in all sword arts we have thrust and exchange of thrusts or we have like counter thrusting right so someone goes to thrust you and you just raise your sword to a um uh you raise your sword to a contrary structure that can overcome the structure of their thrust and you thrust instead and these counter thrusting actions this exchange of point as fury will call it which we can see here in 26 va folio excuse me 26 va um these are um single time actions in the same uh well these are one of the most classic single time actions that there are the first play of longsword um, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Lago section, this play and the master of the sword in one hand, these are some of Fury's most classic single time remedies. Okay. So, um, obviously with the sword in one hand, we have counter thrusts available, right? We have the exchange of point as a concept available to us. We know this independently of Fiore, uh, and we know that this is part of the nature of the sword. However, like we said last week, also, Fiore leaves out more than he puts in. So we're, got, we're about to deal with three plays that are specifically sur uh, surround thrusts, what happens against thrusts, but 
um, where we're not exchanging the point. We're doing something else. So that's just to kind of draw a border around where we or where, or where we are. Um, the reason why we tend to talk about, certainly in recruit class, we tend to talk about cuts and thrusts in sort of different categories is because what you're immediately concerned with, especially as a newer student, it seems pretty different. With thrusts, you're more immediately concerned with, um, you know, resisting them with resolute structures, having a point online, getting your body, um, you know, appropriate so you can counter thrust and things like that. Um, you know, getting your you know range better. And with cuts, you're more concerned with larger actions and, you know, larger follow-ons and, and things like that. So initially they seem pretty different, although really they're not really that different at all. So here we are in 21 RD. He says, you attack me with a thrust, okay, and I beat it to the ground. Okay. So what, is, what does he mean by beat it to the ground and why did he do this? Well, well we're going to find out um, f later in Fiore in the sword and two hand section, we're going to find out from his discussion of thrust and from the posters that Fiore prefers to beat thrusts to the ground when you're lying on the left side. But when you're lying on the right side, he says you could exchange or beat. Now, I wouldn't die on this hill. This is actually an active discussion, uh, an active scholarly discussion um, at, at Emma. Um, but um, there is some very interesting evidence um, for, of, for for both sides, right? Um, some people can say say that you can exchange on both sides. Some will say what I just said that Fury is saying really just exchange on the on the left side and don't exchange on the right. Always beat um, a, a break the point on the right. And so why is this relevant to our current uh, what we're looking at? Well, remember that the master of this section here is low on the left. Okay, and he's, uh, we're still under the impression that we're receiving thrusts from this, uh, or we're, we're defending all of these attacks from this posta. So what we will find out later <laughs> is that um, how I'm going to read this now is going to be supported by evidence we're going to see later, which is that why are we beating these thrusts? We're beating them to the ground because we're lying low on the left. And this is Fury's preferred method of of dealing with these things okay so what's happening here again we're attacked with a thrust and we're going to beat it to the ground which ba basically means our sword is going to pick it up and it's going to move almost 360 degrees right it's going to begin on the um it's going to begin low on the left it's going to pick the sword up on extension and it's going to end up more or less low on the right OK, and you also notice that it appears as if the scholar stepped in with their um, their trailing foot, their left foot, in order to um, make sure that sword is beaten to the ground, which is, I think, stru structurally necessary. It's very difficult to do this just with your hand. Um, uh, arguably impossible. So. From this beginning position the defender has the the patient has received the thrust and he's picked it up transferred it from his left side to his right side and beaten it right down with a passing step in all in one motion okay it seems it might seem like a lot as i described it it might seem like the action is pretty large as i just described it but it's not really <laughs> And remember, the, it's, the opponent's it's coming to you. It's just a windshield wiper. Exactly. exactly. It's, it's just a windshield wiper action. Yeah. Um, and, and so now that we've beaten the sword to the ground, and when we've beaten it, um, I, you know, this is hard not to, uh, not to be on the floor about, but when we're beating swords to the ground, we need to have their sword engage the ground, engage the earth at as near a true cross with our sword as we can. Because if our swords are too oblique, we can actually make their sword pop out from underneath us, from, from underneath our sword. 
and actually pressing it to the ground if our angles are too oblique can actually end up freeing their sword instead of doing what we want so if we've done the beat correctly then we have a pretty decently decent true cross uh, ideally on their flat um, on the enemy's sword but on the edge is fine too and then we're pinning their sword between our sword and the ground and with a little footwork and with you know proper uh, uh, a proper action here we can we can achieve this once the sword is pinned to the ground you can see how this arm is just is just a cherry like it's like a, or not like an apple on a tree here ready to be picked right you can blow through this this elbow so hard you can push it it's just it's perfect right there right and because you stepped in in order to get this beat you basically ensured that this elbow is available to you okay so there's a lot going on here to get us to this point but um it's a place that we've that we're very familiar with already right we're we're entering in on an exposed elbow on their sword arm does that all make sense to everybody third remedy master of dagger that's right that's right the third remedy master of dagger is engaging on the outside of their arm right if we wanted to obviously we don't need to have a sword in our hand we could just drop this and go into our third remedy master for all you know if the, if we want if we wanted to if the situation was right if we had a dagger maybe we'd want to who knows right we could also of course step on the sword as well i'm just sure to deal with steps stepping on the sword here oh there's that there's one step here 21 vb is a step yeah yeah so but we can also we can also potentially get a step on the sword here as well right um so that's another potential check structural check on their sword so this is really shit for this guy <laughs> he's really shit for this guy um, if he's allowed his sword to actually be, be beaten like this okay um yeah yeah any questions anything else you have anything to add there kel no that's good All that's right. good all right. Um, so uh, the next two are in in theme of this. Okay. So we'll we'll continue on. So here we go to this one. Twenty one V A. Um, all, all right. Uh, hey, Kel, there. Would you like to read this uh, text for us? I unfortunately my screen has a great big column of uh, pictures down the right side, and oh, okay. and your screen is tiny, so I can't. No problem. Um, how about um, I can read if you Please. want. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think I can. So, I have quickly come to this situation after turning you by pushing your elbow. I did this to throw you to the ground so you won't pick you any more fights with me or any more, anyone else. <laughs> Sorry, because the, the, no, I'm no. reading the, the second edition. <laughs> Good, and good. the letters I'm reading through the Discord, so it's no, it's not uh, perfect. I was more. laughing at the language. I, I was laughing at Fury. Oh, the accent. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 at Fury, at Fury. It's just, it's just funny. Yeah. It, like sometimes, so, sometimes he talks about himself like he's a superhero. Like I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna de defeat you, and you'll never hurt anyone else ever again, or whatever. That's funny. Um, okay. Yeah. Basically, you really can tell him sounds better. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I suppose maybe it does. Yeah. <laughs> you've done you've done something so foolish that you can never get back up. That's you right. are so. That's right. so you're, you're, saying, you're saying Canadian, your ass is grass. Your ass is grass, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so, um, so twenty one VA. What happened here? Okay. So before we even talk about it, let's remember where what we're doing we're fighting with swords in one hand and these are not arming swords although of course all of this is applicable these are the same swords we're going to be using in the sword in two hands section right but a sword is a sword. Sword, sword. Is a sword but remember we have this <laughs> we have this big fuck off sword and here we are in close grappling how the hell did did we did we get here so the first thing to note and remember is that, ah, no, don't look at the code, <laughs> is that swordsmanship in no way, um, in no way um, guarantees He's just sword. Largo. In no way, it in no way guarantees space, right? Um, and this is why, um, in large part, this is why 
grappling and knowledge of daggers and close play with weapons is so critical to swordsmanship because you, it could happen at any time. And if you don't have all of that bubbling up underneath the surface, you're going to lose precious tempo in figuring out what the fuck to do while someone is um, is murdering you. So you, you have to have it. It's not an option. And so here we have a situation where from a, an attack at Jokolarko, at this long play, from a nice clean attack against a refused patient agent sitting in this low guard, we've come all the way into close grappling. So how do we get here? So what's happened is we've received an attack and we've done this elbow push. What we've made the cover, right? We've received an attack. We've made the cover threatening the single time remedy. Our, our um, partner has um, reacted to that to either stop our single time remedy um, or, uh, or of course we've made a deflection uh, as Cal, as Cal said, and we've got this elbow push somehow we've got this elbow push. Okay. And when we push this elbow, our opponent countered and there's, they brought their sword. Um, they, 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 they tried to recover their sword. And actually, uh, it's really great that Kel, that you brought up that beat, uh, point because, um, I've always understood this play to actually be a result of being beaten uh, in precisely the way that you described. So the sword gets wildly beaten, um, from a, uh, uh, um, um, a mezzano from the right, right? Doing a mezzano from the right against against this guy, and you're going to get a stonking beat uh, uh, on the flat against that mezzano, and that sword's going to going to fly out into the ether unless this swordsman uh, recovers it. And so, what this you know, this is somewhat speculative, but one with thing that explains why the swordsman is all of a sudden grasps his sword in two hands is he's tried to recover the energy of that sword by bringing the sword back to him. Or you have not completely borne it to the ground. Exactly. Oh, that's, an, that's, another, <clears throat> that's, an, uh, that's another way as well. You've tried the beat. Exactly. Yeah, you've tried the, uh, the, 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 the breaking of point, and he's countered. Right? He, he's re tried to recover the sword. And if we're, um, if we're looking at what the scholar's doing, what the enemy's doing, he's recovering his sword in, in, um, in a, in a half sword position, sword in two hands. Right. And this is, um, bastard cross. I'm, I'm imagining yeah. his, his thumb, his thumb in on, oh no. Mm. True cross. What am I, uh... It's just a mess. Well, anyways, it's something. It's either True Cross or Pastor Cross. <laughs> from the it's, sword it's, I want my sword back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's he's trying to recover the sword and bring it back into play, which is not a bad idea, right? What he's doing isn't necessarily poor. The problem is, is that he's behind in tempo. And the recovering the sword isn't actually going, uh, isn't actually helping him remedy the situation he finds himself in. Because recovering the sword is not preventing the scholar's entry. So he's going to get his uh, he's going to get his ass grassed in just a second. Okay, if I can a... make a comment here. Yes, please. This particular action plays out very frequently from someone who knows how to get out of the way or feels that he's headed for disaster, but he does not let go of the concept of being in a sword fight. Sword fight is not necessarily just swords, but a lot of people believe it is. Yeah. So yeah. doing everything to concentrate on the sword allows you to fall into Abanazade. That's right. That's exactly right. And let's um, refresh in our minds the third um, play of Abanazade, which is, oops, oh, no, I'm, yeah, here we go, which is the... <laughs> the high throw in post longer with a leg pickup. Okay, which is folio 6VC in the Getty. And so sure enough, we have pretty much this exact same play. We're going to get this high throw. Um, we're going to blast his face with this post longer. We're going to get a nice, um, we're going to get a nice uh, third play throw here. And we also have the potential to wound him with our sword. All right. It's not obvious what's going on with the scholar's sword in his hand. I read this as this sword not being in his hand. I read this as this scholar going for this third um, this third play of grappling, and the sword is there. 
once the, the throw is made, the scholar can, you know, grab, grasp the sword in two hands and thrust down. He can step back and, you know, cut with the he full He can length deal of the with sword, other opponents. Do, deal with other opponents, exactly, right? What, whatever, whatever, okay? But um, this is what we're talking about. Okay, that makes sense? All right. Okay, and um, yeah, and and actually, as an addendum, the reading this as coming from as a reaction to the break is probably the most logical because um, this is kind of where the headspace is at, right? We had twenty one RD. It's likely that twenty one VA is a reaction to the break, though it can come from other things like we like we said. Uh, and then so here we go again with the uh, reactions to thrusts. So a uh, folio 21 VB, can we have uh, Amber have uh, read, read the tech? This one attacked my head and I beat his sword away, arriving to this situation. Without fail, I can turn you and whip my sword to your neck, showing you just how spirited I am. All right, so I lied to you. <laughs> ha ha, I was just testing you and you passed. So this isn't <laughs> to do with thrusts, um, but uh, <laughs> it's very similar to thrusts, as we can as we can see. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happened? He attacked uh, the the scholar got attacked um, to the head, fendente of some kind, squilimbro, whatever, and the scholar achieved a beat, but he arrived at this situation. Without fail, I can turn my, uh, I can turn you, as we know, whip the sword to your neck, as we know, and whisper sweet insults into your ear. So what's the takeaway with this position? Well, the takeaway I would say is that while it's possible to get this kind of suppression, um, to get the kind of suppression we see in the 8th Scholar, 21RD, it's possible to get that kind of suppression against thrusts, and we know that that's a common scenario for breaking a point um, from the sword and two hand section. It's also possible for us to get this kind of suppression against cuts, depending on how the engagement uh, uh, happens and what happens with their sword. Right? Some, uh, you know, the more skilled swordsmen will naturally bring their sword into uh, back into posta when their sword gets deflected, right? Um, when you when you see, you know, the, when you imagine the classic peri repost of two master fencers, um, it's not necessarily that, you know, nobody is ever getting obliques or beats, right? It's that by the time... Uh, whatever tempo advantage that any of the one master's actions builds up, it's the the play is equalized when they take advantage of it. The other master is compensated, right? So just because you get beat or obliqued doesn't necessarily mean that it's curtains for you. Um, there's things that you can do to 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 react to it. But if you react poorly, then um, you can have really horrible things happen to you and be killed in hilarious ways, uh, like this one, right? This guy had a sword uh, a beat, but it was, not only was it beat, not only did it go away, it went to the ground and was able to be uh, to be suppressed. Um, another, another way to read this as well is, let's just say you go for a beat, right? And your opponent is able to turn his edge in a little bit, maybe shift his hips a little bit, and kind of stymies your your attempted deflection, attempted beat, whatever. If they don't have a significant structure, right, if their sword is extended and you have good placement on their blade, it's possible to just break the point from that engagement even then, to, to, to break the sword down and, and, and step on it, okay? So those are two perfectly possible things. With respect to what's actually going on here with the scholar, we've seen this a bunch of times already. He's got a he's got suppression on the sword. He's got entry to the outside of the sword arm, and he's threatening the thrust in prime. So in that sense, there's nothing nothing mysterious. Any questions about this one?
No? All right. Okay, and um, last but not least, certainly not least, we have 21 VC. Um, and I'll read this one. <clears throat> 21 VC. This is a play in which to use this thrust, you should be in armor. <laughs> if the opponent attacks you with a thrust or a cut, parry and immediately do was shown in the illustration. So this play is freaking cool, okay? And it's actually very important. First of all, he's specifically mentioned sword and armor here, right? So as we've been noting all throughout uh, this course, it's, it's, it's very interesting when Fiore gives us some information about subjects he's going to cover right about things that he's going to talk about because it's at least evidence that he was thinking about a section that comes after right rather than just adding it on or whatever else so in the sword in one hand section right before even a discussion of the sword in two hand section right all of these figures by the way are drawn are being drawn without armor there's some hats and helms uh, swan hat uh, really uh, really uh, special uh, swan hat yeah but um the sword and two hand section is um, principally articulated um as the, with the figures out of armor and so too this section here sword in one hand all of these figures are not in armor which in and of itself is a departure from what we've been talking about already because throughout the grappling and abrazar section in so so many places we've noted Fiore's insistence on bringing up the notion of fighting in armor so that we couldn't possibly read Abrazare or Dagger thinking that he intended to only frame these things in an unarmored context, right? That he want, he seems to be wanting us to think with both sides of our brain about armored and unarmored. Here, it's not, it has, so far, it hasn't really quite been like that, right? Or he, at least he hasn't gone pains to emphasize armor. But at the end of the section... He does something which we could, first of all, we can understand to him for him to be intentionally bringing this back, right? Remember, there's armor. We've talked about it the whole book so far. I don't want you to forget it. And armor uh, swords can be used in one hand, even in armor, right? So don't forget that. So that's that's the first thing to say about this one. Um, the second thing to say about this one is, well, we should really look at the armor section, okay? Because the cool thing about this play really does show when you um, look at the armored section. So the sword and armor section, um, all, all the armored stuff begins after the Senyo page, on folio 32R. And the sword and armor section begins on folio 32VA. Okay? And the first play here is what we're going to look at. Um, the first master uh, at, is at folio 33RC. And the follow-on is 32RD. Uh, sorry, 33RD. What we're looking at here is we're looking at the master catch a play or a, a cut or a thrust in what's called true cross, and then step in, suppress the weapon, put the point on line to the armpit, and step that point in. Uh, I'd like to make a distinction there. Please do. He's playing from the post, a uh, true cross. Right. And makes this cover by moving forward from true cross. Right. This particular configuration in the image of the master mm -hmm. is not what you could confuse with Jor, um, uh, what's his name? Silver's true cross oh yes yes and you can't and he also has saint george's cross for this thing so right. if you think of this particular position as true cross you're actually going to be very confused when you try to do the posta true cross yes let me uh, thank you very much for that let, let's uh, underline that point here posta di vera croce <laughs> true cross i should have shown that come out of this position roll yeah. forward into that cover that creates that particular crossing against either uh, cut any kind of cut 
anybody that's stupid enough to make a uh, right. a mandrito cut against you in armor deserves to be humiliated. That's right. But uh, this particular one, a fendente or a thrust, where someone drops a fendente and, pr and produces a thrust, coming forward from this true cross position allows you to make that crossing and do a, a variety of things. And also, you can pick up their weapon at any number of places in that that's right. sweep. But that's something that's a little confusing for for people that are looking at why are we looking at this based on uh, the sword in one hand. Well, right. it's very simple. You get close together. If you have armor, you can do whatever you like because you don't have to worry about incidental contact with their weapon. Right. But in this case, you have set their weapon so far aside that you have the opportunity to swing up your, in, uh, your offhand mm -hmm. to the middle of the sword and support a shortened thrust. Mm -hmm. um, this particular play works out especially well against reversal cuts. And so, um, you know, j just like that, um, just like last class, we had to contextualize um, swords before we really got into it. Before we really get into the armor section, we're going to have to contextualize armor. So a lot of this stuff about armor and what what armor ends up uh, is going to end up meaning to us and, how, you know, how we have to understand being in armor versus not. We're going to definitely spend more time on that on that later. Um, but this is a taster. Okay? And May Carol, I have something? Yeah, uh, Aaron? Just, one, just one thing. I just want to emphasize something that you said, that um, a main point uh, the, a main point of difference between being out of armor and being in armor is that um, you're immune, when you're in armor, you're immune to what we call incidental uh, cuts. So um, to defeat armor, we often need to defeat it with um, significant thrusts, cuts are armors usually proof against cuts, broadly speaking. And so it makes sense to see a figure at the end of the sword in uh, this sword one hand section. When we're in an armored context, it makes sense to see him going to this uh, short thrust. So please, May I? A lot more frequently. Please, Ricardo, please. Oh, Ricardo, please, yeah. Sorry. Uh, just something here that uh, I usually bring up to the question uh, we have been seeing all the the moves and now everything using the sword as a normal sword now is the first time with that we see mezza spata mm -hmm. without the armor so don't forget that at short distance you can also grab the sword yes. and just stick him very yes. very easily with more control than than doing uh, the other stuff so absolutely just, uh, yep. correct absolutely, absolutely. correct like a, your a point, 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 point your point control in sword in two hands uh, with Mezza Spada is so much more significant. It's like yeah. playing darts versus throwing balloons. Yeah. It's yeah. so Using, much uh, different. A full, uh, a full stick. Mm -hmm. A full stick? Uh, a, 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 pool, a, a billiard. Pool yeah. Snooker. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Some reason my head went to Jogo the Pau. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, right that's on. that's absolutely right, uh, Ricardo. I, I I echo that as well. Yeah, um, very good observation. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a whole lot in this play, if we actually take the time to consider it. Um, where maybe if we just took a cursory glance at it, there wouldn't it didn't seem like there was much. Or maybe it's question. nothing, and we are just talking about it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's also that's also possible, and quite frankly, that's what keeps me up at night. Maybe I'm making all this shit up, but uh, but we'll gloss over that for now, or I'll need another beer. Yeah, we we worry <laughs> about that in your free scholar test, actually. Yes, uh, so I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. So um, so we're uh, that's it. That is the sword in one hand section. Okay, we've made it all the way through. So the next section that we have to look forward to is um, to begin the sword in two hands section. And I'm not, I don't want to start it tonight. Uh, I want to start it fresh next week. But I just want to give a bit of a taster of what we're going to look at next week and then pause for questions and, and final comments and things. Okay, so the sword in two hands section. Um, one might consider it to begin 
with the first of the guards here at 22 RA and finish with the final um, master uh, here at 31 uh, R A to B. Okay, so that's the portion of the manuscript that um, conventionally describes a uh, portion of the Getty that conventionally describes the sword and two hand section. Um, and this uh, section is divided into several broad categories. Um, the first category are the guards, um, which includes a set of six guards and a set of 12 postas. Um, and there's a lot of interesting commentary on the nature of the guards and the postas, and what you can do, um, some plays involved, tons of really interesting and important stuff in this section. Uh, me personally, this is this the section of the sword and two hands that um, I've criminally understudied myself. The the plays get um, I find the plays get far more attention than um, uh, the postas, um, including all of the plays that are within the posta texts and there's a lot of plays within the posta texts so um this, this section is really really important but it's going to teach us about the guards and about about what fury what fury likes as well what the section uh, on the guards teaches is why the guard is named that way Right. If you look at why the guard is named that way across the various weapons and without weapons, the actions are very similar. So it's not so much the formation of the guard as the actions available from it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the actions available from it, it very clearly informs how the guard is formed. Mm -hmm. So it's not about stand like this and then you can do these things. It's you can do these things because you're standing like this. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. You have them available to you because you're ready. And that will help you form the guard as you're practicing and becoming more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. and, and remember, understanding the guards, well, Fury's system of martial arts seems to, based on this book, seems to be founded specifically on postas. When you're in posta, you have several options. Here are, here are the posters I want you to use. These, uh, all the all the options you have, all the plays I'm talking about, can be done from all the posts I've described. So the one flows uh, from the other. So very important. Um, so the next section in this Sword in Two Hands uh, part of the book is going to be the section of cuts. There's four images, Fendente, Sotani, um, Mezzani, and Thrusts. And there's a little commentary in there as well, so that will be that will be interesting. Um, then uh, Fury gives a little preface to the section, and then he gives all the plays. And all the plays in the Sword and Two Hands section are articulated in broadly these three categories. Although this is a little small, it's just the one picture. But we have half of the plays coming in the Jogo Largo category, and half of the plays coming in Jogo Stretto category. And when we get here, we'll talk about <laughs> what is Largo, what is Stretto, how to understand it, and, and what's the difference, and, and so on. But this is usually, uh, usually has the bulk of the focus of people when we study the Sword in Two Hand and Fury. And then we have a final uh, master here at the end, very end. Um, he's got the forked beard, which is interesting, and he has some, some cool things to say. So that's what we're going to look forward to next week. Next week, we'll probably spend the whole time on the guards and the cuts, maybe. We'll see how far we get. And then the following week, probably Largo, and then next week, Strato, and then move on. There's a lot of plays and a lot of things to talk about. Um, so that's what we have. Yeah, and um, we're also, uh, I'll say it one last time, books are the kinds of technology that, allow you access to all the information in them you just have to turn to the page and so just because something is after in the book doesn't mean that it's you know if, strictly speaking it has to follow after or whatever we can always go forward or back or forward or back as much as we want and so when we're reading all the stuff about the sword in two hands and we're studying the sword let's remember that we've already gone through a whole section of sword swordsmanship and we want to make sure that while we're reading about the sword in two hands, we're also informing our understanding of the sword in one hand as well. Uh, and, you know, of course, the sword in, in a sheath, 
too, right? We, the sword, uh, um, the dagger and sword section has has the sword being used as well. So yeah, um, pretty exciting, and it's also pretty exciting we've got this far. I'm really really pleased that um, we're 10, 10, 11 sessions in now. Um, so let's pause um, and take questions, comments. Yeah, Aaron, everybody. can you uh, quickly like summarize the eleven scholar? Because I, I don't like. Sure. I, uh, sorry, see, I'm a bit late and it's a bit a bit tired, so like I don't think like, I caught the actual um, what actually happens in the play itself. I did. Uh, I don't blame you. I did blab a lot. Um, so, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> this is not news. The the um, the scholar has beaten um, the opponent's uh, sword away oh no um oh we don't we don't know okay no no we don't know back this one up yeah roll up to the image okay um uh who was that alex had asked that yeah i didn't hear i didn't hear the question for some reason i don't hear any i I heard ricardo and i heard trinity but i the rest of you i can't hear in any case this particular play um It often plays out. I'm not saying that it has to. I'm saying it often plays out from you making a good wide cover against a reverso cut, whether it's Mm -hmm. Fendente or Mezzano, and you get their sword to the other side. They've already stepped forward, but their arm's still moving. So the parts of their upper body are still swinging to their right. This gives you the tempo to step in. But because your sword's already in the middle, you stepping in beside your sword. You don't have to move your sword at all in your hand. Literally, your wrist yeah. rotates around the grip in place. Yeah. So by grabbing the sword with your off hand, you've stabilized it. Their sword is still on a downward trajectory, hopefully. Mm-hmm. If it isn't, you really waited a long time. Yeah. But... Uh, when you step in with this, you can plant a thrust very quickly against someone who's struggling to reverse the movement of their sword down and to their right. Uh, I like to stick to the terms of Scholar and Zugadori when we're working with the Getty because they're very clear throughout the entire manuscript, whereas in the, in the Novati or Pazani Dossi, sometimes there's a little mix-up. Uh, but... In this particular case, you're almost never going to get to this position from a finente dorito. It's just not going to happen, right? So the chances of you catching a secondary blow, for example, you set aside the first one and it had an indistinct conclusion. If they throw their second one over the left shoulder or from the left shoulder, to which, whichever target you have, you can sweep it. The same thing as a, it's a beat, right? You're beating it aside. Whether you get a, a flat oblique or whether you get a true beat, eh, it's, it's a toss at a coin. But once their sword continues on its trajectory past the center line, you can step into that void, grabbing your sword on the way in. You're doing all the movement. The sword really never moves anywhere from the center line. So this is not spoken of in the text it's not specifically implied but when you play it out a hundred times more than 90 of them will turn out in this situation so but what do you actually get by sorry off the soapbox now well so so he says specifically alex that you should be in armor when you do this so uh, though he doesn't draw the figures in armor so we can take this two ways one we can take this as, as him saying, if you're fighting with a sword in one hand and you're in armor and the situation is right, you can step in, grasp the sword with your off hand and put a thrust to his armpit to defeat the enemy's armor. And that this is a great thing to do. Okay. May I? Yes, please. Aaron? Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, in the translation that I have for Portuguese, so I'm following through this through also over here in the and the another part. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first part he says, this is a play that you should do if you are in armor, okay? But if your opponent strikes you with a cut or a stab, first do your defense. And I think this is the point mm-hmm. where uh, we should start. After the defense is made, we are in a very short distance. So rapidly use this strike as shown. 
So if you are in a situation that you are in the Jogo Stretto and then don't want to make an Abrazare technique, you uh, because you have just parried or you just defend yourself, you are in a shorter distance. So as um, Kel told before, mm-hmm. you are at the side of your sword. You can grab it mm-hmm. in a in a mezza spata, and then you can just stabby stabby with the pointy part. Exactly. So so the so I yep, said there very were well two, done. I said there were two um, there were two basic scenarios. One, you're in armor, and two, you're not. And Ricardo articulated uh, how you can do this even if you're not in armor. I'd also like to point out the translator of this text in, in both of the first and second version mm-hmm. is Tom Leone, yes. who wouldn't know what armor was about other than a picture on the wall and posing for photographs. <laughs> he might, he might he own is, some uh, in, a, in a castle or in a mansion somewhere. <laughs> no, he's, he's got uh, some late period, like, Glanschnick type armor. But, yeah. um, no, I know the guy. Even, uh, even the, the, it, the, Italian, the Italian that it, it is is very simple to to current yeah, Italian or it's, Roman. It's, so it's, it's, kind it's of more like this is better in armor. This is yeah. recorded, Kel, you know that, right? I don't care. <laughs> Okay. All right. Great. Well, um, if you met Tom Leone, you think he's going to beat me up? No, I, no, that's not. I'm just, just saying. All right. Um, so Alex, did that, uh, that answer your, uh, your question there? Yes. Yes. This has been great actually. And like, right, I, I, I will say that it's, it is very helpful to like have this, uh, you know, yeah, I think I've said from obviously Ricardo, who's a, a guest from, uh, into Portugal. Did you say? Yeah. Ricardo, which part of yeah. Portugal? Porto. Porto. Okay, very nice. Yeah. Uh, well, I've been to Spain. I have yet to be to Portugal, but uh, that and who's Trinity Trinity Arbor? That's that's Amber. Yeah. Oh, it's the oh, Amber. oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, I just I, you know like I, I miss you guys because I don't teach classes anymore. So you know it's nice to hear your voices and know that you're still active in this. It's it's great and it's especially wonderful to have a, a guest from overseas come and join us and have a chat. Like I say, I don't often uh, pop into to Aaron's Sunday night classes because he's doing such a good job on, on the, uh, with the scholar classes. I know he's doing a good job with you guys, oh, thanks, but quite frankly, I had time tonight and I really enjoyed it. So thank you all very much for, uh, you know, being with us. I'm very glad you came, Cal. I'm glad to hear you, Cal. everybody. Thank you, Cal. Uh, any, any, last, uh, any last questions, comments? I have a comment, Please. if I may. So I, I, I was just kept silent for a lot of time. Mm-hmm. And as you know me from other places, I normally I'm, I'm a lot of speaker guy. <laughs> um, so uh, when you address the part of the, knowing the, um, the Abrazare techniques and the, the dagger techniques as a technique, for me, everything that is is short distance, is something that is more, um, uh, it's more uh, Straight high level. It's more high level mm. for a, a part of the fencer. Why? Mm. Because it's easy mm. for a, a new fencer just to try to keep at the distance mm. at, at the very uh, far side of the sword. That's why, uh, for example, uh, spears are very easy to give to someone that's not trained because it tries to be at far parts of the of the weapon. Uh, so. For he, for the uh, Fiore to understand and to bring the the short distance and the, the the techniques on a short, it's having something better for people that are not used to. I usually give this advice to to to, to my students when you don't know or when you have a, a a guy that's very brute, just force against him so you don't have space to move because he's not trained in that. And I think that Fiori most of the times shows something like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, entering in the stretto and the mezzo, mezzo gioco and then gioco stretto goes for there. And I think that's just a, 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 a mean for him to show the superiority of his fighting and his learnings and doing the mastery of the, the combat, not the sword, but of the combat uh, uh, in all senses. But this is just a point of view. Thank you very much. I agree with we share it we very much. Share between I us. agree totally. I would like mm-hmm. I would like to add a small thing because mm-hmm. uh, in in terms of uh, in uh, English comprehension of it, and it may be a different way of explaining it in Portuguese. But the idea of the transitions from close plays to long plays and then using long plays or close plays within long plays with longer weapons, for example, the sword, the, especially the lance. Um, mm-hmm. 
there's a great deal to be learned from strato where you're using leverage at close range yeah. that transitions even to longer weapons the idea of making your cover with a spear if you've uh, never handled anything anything but a spear you'll never learn any sort of control over the leverage of the weapon whereas when you're at arm's length you learn control of the leverage of the person adding a weapon to it increases that leverage so as the weapon gets longer you have more and more opportunity to use your range of control over them with leverage be it soft or hard this is a continuum that goes right into poleaxe and quite frankly into lance on horseback yeah. i'm no expert at lance on horseback but the leverage of parrying with a spear from horseback on the move is so incredible that you have to have fine digital control of it it's a very subtle thing which you wouldn't think of on horseback it's much more subtle to make a mezza spada with a spear like the equivalent of mezza lanza whatever with a spear as you're moving on a large animal in armor so that the tiny control that you need to make those covers all flows from the basics of you learning to control at hand length so it's a full continuum if you don't learn to grapple mm -hmm. you can't learn dagger as well and then therefore your sword is much more shallow in context and when you get to sword in two hand you have a bunch of tricks or you have a full art so ricardo i completely agree with you i just wanted to expand on that for our students thank yeah. you both very much um any scholars we got on the chat andrew bd and connor um andrew would you like to go first do you have anything to add or subtract uh no really no okay uh bd so the um the first couple of uh, uh first couple of sword and one hand plays i see is directly uh, relatable to the first couple of Largo plays, so certain first play, second play, except you have an ascending blade instead of a descending blade. Mm -hmm. And then the distance, I like the phrase closest weapon to closest target. Mm -hmm. So, and personally, I, I like to infight. So the idea, once you get close enough to be able to grab the palm or push the elbow, do so. That's more of a philosophical difference. Mm -hmm. But sure. to me, that's where I almost see a Largo and Strato uh, partition between the sword in one hand uh, plays because of that. And then, of course, once you get close enough, you're using your, your left hand. It's, it's all um, <clears throat> it's all stretto type of plays. And as mentioned earlier by either yourself or Kel, sensitivity being the order of the, of the day. Just don't forget, only grab swords when they are stopped. By <laughs> I have, one, see, uh, <laughs> I have uh, one thing in my group that is, I am the responsible for it. And the only injuries that we had were guys trying to grab swords while they were moving and they were using the the, um, the softer ones. So confidence mm -hmm. when they think that the armor is not a problem right. is yeah. the only problem that I have in 10 years doing this. Yeah two broken fingers for my students nice. and yeah. I, I'm very proud of that so the, nice. uh, since we are doing classes nearly three times a week and only two, only two fingers in 10 years I think it's a great deal it's that's bad. pretty good it's, not bad. it's a it's a difficult thing uh, especially with the dagger because we usually train with a wooden rondelle which has been turned on a lathe mm -hmm. uh, it has no edges and people are happy to grab the blade and smash around and stab with it and whatnot um, the first time you put something with an edge in their hand, yeah. they stop thinking. It doesn't make any sense anymore. And uh, it's very important for us to respect the weapons as if they were real sharp oh. weapons. And it's the hardest thing to get across to the imagination of our students that we're training with something that's blunt. I mean, we, we've been using aluminum swords for a very, very long time. They're incredibly Lord. safe. Worse, they, and, they've broken fingers with the foam swords. Oh, yes. I know. How are you I know, because, because people have yeah. no contact. They have no respect yeah, well, for it. None. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. No, no, I totally agree. Absolutely. Good yeah. point. Good point. 
a real pleasure to speak with you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I miss you all from the South. I don't know whenever I'll get back to Toronto again, but, you know, I'll try my best to come out next Sunday night because, um, or I should say Monday night, because uh, there's nothing on TV Monday nights. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming, Cal. Have a good night. Have a good night. Bye. Uh, Connor, did you have anything last uh, to, to add there? Me? No, I do not. Nope. That was a one. This was a wonderful class. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, thank no, thank you guys all very much for coming. This will be in YouTube in a couple of days, and um, yeah, yeah, we'll see you next week with the start of the sword and two hands section. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Aaron.